What's up, y'all? Your resident city cast, Chicago theater lover, is back with another recommendation and world premiere. This time, I'm talking about Timeline Theater's homegrown play, Black Sunday. It follows a Texas family trying to save their farm during the Great American Dust Bowl of the 1930s. To say it was rough is an understatement. Now, while some family members want to pack up for California, some are still holding on to hope even as one of the country's most destructive dust storms of all time is fast approaching. Take a remarkable trip back in time to witness this haunting story of climate change, migration, and family. The play is running now through June 29th. For tickets and more information, visit TimelineTheater.com. Today on CityCast Chicago, the city council votes to potentially keep shot spotter around. We check in on Illinois' rebrand of CARP and we celebrate a group of West Side community gardeners. Joining me on this beautiful morning from WTTW, the Chicago Tonight anchor, Brandis Freeman, and freelance writer Rima Saleh. It's Friday, May 24th. I'm Jacoby Cochran, and this is what Chicago is talking about. Good morning, Rima. How you feeling today? Good, good. I'm excited to chat. No, we are excited to have you here. Also, we're joined by Brandis. Brandis, I saw you last week at the at the gala, and now we're here on CityCast Chicago. We appreciate you stopping by. That's right. Looking forward to it. Thanks for having me. Now, before we jump into the stories, uh, we have been enjoying this weather all week. And on Wednesday, the City Cash Chicago team pulled up to Mario's Italian Lemonade on Taylor Street to grab a few Italian ices. But uh, we also discussed some of our favorite frozen treats in Chicago. I want to know what is your favorite frozen treat in Chicago? Do you have a place you like to go to get something, you know, sweet and cold when that weather starts getting better. Brandis, I'm gonna start with you. Yes, I have an answer for this one. I'm not a huge ice cream person, which makes me a weirdo in my house. I like ice cream, it's fine, (laughs) it's fine. Don't come for me, people. Um, But there is this place called Pretty Cool. I like the location in Logan Square, but they Mm -hmm. recently opened another one in uh, Lincoln Park. It's called Pretty Cool, and they make these amazing ice cream bars. Ooh, I'm looking at a picture right now. Mm Mm-hmm. super fun creative flavors and they've got like little ones for the kids it's like you know slightly simpler flavors like pony pops or whatever i think they do something for your dog um but their ice cream bars are the best i recommend pretty cool ice cream people no they got some strawberry lemonade ice cream sandwiches a kyoto cold brew see what i'm talking about and then i think they've got like some vegan options too there's um horchata crunch that my husband and I like to get, or there's another one that's like a key lime pie something. Mm. Ooh, the caramel horchata crunch. That's the one right there. Ooh, Rima, over to you. You got a place where you love to go uh, to get a good frozen treat during the summertime, this late spring season we in? Yeah, I mean, that's the grocery store. I just go to Jewel to go to the ice cream section. (laughs) I only get sorbet now because I feel like that's, I can only have fruit ice cream in the summer. Okay. Um, sometimes I go to Jenny's, which I like. I like the the blackberry ice cream one. I like that you keep it real though. I just I go to Jewel. Respect. What's your favorite flavor of sorbet? I really like the raspberry one, like the raspberry talenti ones. I eat them like all the time. It's actually a problem. <laughs> no, we love that. This conversation is making me want some some frozen treats now. I have some because I eat like half of one a day and then I have the other one in case I get sad. Never <laughs> in case I get sad. You're never out of stock. <laughs> If you are new to City Cash Chicago, every Friday we love to bring in these amazing people to look back on some of the stories uh, that not only the entire city was looking at this week, but also some of the stories that maybe people uh, didn't catch wind of. But we're going to start with a big one. Brandis, City Council took a vote on the future of ShotSpotter, the controversial gunshot technology. Uh, a quick recap for folks. Uh, during Brandon Johnson's campaign for mayor, he made it clear that he did not support ShotSpotter. This came not too long after multiple investigations found the technology 
isn't as effective of a crime fighting tool as the company and law enforcement want folks to believe that it's alerts can't always be trusted. It doesn't necessarily help prevent shootings uh, or lead police or ambulance to get to an area any faster or apprehend any firearms. So when Brandon Johnson got into office, the thought was he was, you know, quickly going to move to eliminate the tech. However, you know, as he settled into City Hall, his tone changed a bit as he had to balance between his allies who supported removing Shot Spotter and their others who wanted to ultimately be the decision makers in their wards. And now, currently, the contract runs until November. Brandis, catch us up on the measure that City Council took up on Wednesday. So uh, Alderman David Moore, um, he wanted to force a vote, right? So it kind of led to a showdown that happened yesterday. And basically his intention in that measure was that the shot spotter contract could not be canceled um, or could not be removed from any ward unless the city council approved of it. It also called for CPD to deliver data on the effectiveness and the impact of uh, of shot spotter. Except I think the problem with some of that is CPD has presented data and that data um, it was proven to be not the most reliable. It, it exactly. Wasn't. I was like, we've already <laughs> done this sort of rope duck already, G. Ex- exactly, right? Well, and at the same time, I think uh, Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox, as well as uh, Chicago Inspector General Deborah Witzberg, all of them had said that, you know, this it's it's not effective. Um, it, except there were a number of aldermen, and apparently, I think this was a surprise to folks who watched City Hall, 34 of them voted with Alderman Moore on not being able to remove this. The thing is, some fo- I think the mayor's office is saying this doesn't really do anything because the city council doesn't actually have the authority to do this. The mayor um, has the authority to, to keep or to, to get rid of this contract. Yeah, he was very like... I mean, he he was clear. He's already said he wanted to uh, sort of slowly remove shot spotter contract in this September, get it done by the end of November. Some alders were very emotional during the city council meeting in their support of this technology. Uh, at one point, uh, Monique Scott said she was disappointed and alders who voted against this that, you know, her her ward has seen multiple mass shootings this year. Uh, and, and while I do not want to uh disrespect that that feeling i know what it is like to be impacted by gun violence directly and indirectly and yet even as she was saying that i'm like but shot spotter was there during this and what what did it do and so you you sort of had this this clear back and forth between alders and yet as you said the vote was pretty decisive the vote was pretty decisive, and I can't remember exactly how many um, are needed if the mayor should veto this. Like, can they can they override his veto? Mm-hmm. And then what happens as a result of that? At the same time, can they use a vote of 34 to put pressure on the mayor to find a way to reinstate it, right? If 34 of your aldermen who represent 34 wards and constituents in the city of Chicago are saying that this needs to stick around, is, is he going to stick around? We had Kim Fox on the show this week. The other point that she made as well about this, because she, her office has also said that this is not effective, that there's no, um, there's nothing that says that it makes the city any safer, is it is a product, right? And so the doubling down on this one particular product, which purports to be, you know, a crime fighting tool, despite, you know, evidence to the contrary, there are other ways to fight crime. And why is everybody um, attaching themselves so wholeheartedly to this one particular um, device, to this one piece of technology? And to see that so many of the city council members are on the side of not only this product, but the idea that that this technology is sort of the saving grace. And again, we all want gun violence to, to go down in Chicago. We want to see large scale investments in the neighborhoods that are disproportionately impacted by gun violence. And yet we want to see strategies that are adapting and listening and responding to data. Uh, and, and right now, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem like or it's clear city council and the mayor's office aren't, aren't on the same page about that. Again, this contract is supposed to come to an end September 22nd and then sort of a slow a de-escalation of its use going into November. So we'll continue looking at this.
Yo, for everybody listening, I wanted to remind y'all of something. The City of Chicago Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection Office of Labor Standards oversees Chicago's landmark labor laws through engagement and enforcement. What does that mean for you? Well, Chicago's labor laws include minimum wage, paid sick leave, fair work week, wage theft, contracts for domestic care workers, and anti-retaliation. And even more, on July 1st, 2024, the following ordinances and update will go into effect. Number one, Chicago paid leave and paid sick and safe leave ordinance. Number two, a five-year phase out of the sub-minimum wage for tipped workers. And number three, the annual minimum wage increase. Remember, the Office of Labor Standards processes complaints, conducts investigations, mediates disputes, directs settlement proceedings, issues violations, and if necessary, seeks licensure discipline against employers. For more information, visit www.chicago.gov backslash labor standards. And if you need to file a complaint, call 311 for Chicago labor law violations. But let's stay with a, another measure that was supposed to come up during this meeting on Wednesday. And that's been a resolution calling for Dorval Carter, the leader of the CTA, um, to essentially be fired from his post. Uh, he is one of the highest earning public officials, making over three hundred thousand dollars, I think over three hundred forty thousand uh, dollars annually. The hope was for city council members to take a vote of no confidence. Ultimately, the decision on whether or not to stay with Carter is, again, left up to Mayor Brandon Johnson. I talked with the mayor uh, a couple of weeks ago now, and he you know, gave me the same line he's given everybody, which is I don't talk about hirings and firings in the public. So now city council, again, wants to exert some control in this. Uh, Rima, can you remind listeners, how do we get here? And what did um, what happened at city council on Wednesday in regard to uh, this vote? Alderman Andre Vasquez introduced this ordinance to fire Dorval Carter, and before it had even gotten introduced, like 29 aldermen had signed on to be a sponsor, which was like kind of crazy. There was the impression that like Dorval Carter wasn't being seen as an accountable figure. He ghosted to um, city council meetings that he was supposed to kind of testify at. That really pissed off a lot of aldermen. Um, and then they passed an ordinance saying he has to show up four times a year to testify in front of the transit committee. Um, and he started doing that. He started showing up. I think that's really mm -hmm. nice. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> there's just this feeling that the CTA hasn't been able to return to service. Like bus service has come back a bit. It, like they've put back um, more scheduled runs for that. Rail service is still kind of struggling. It's really fixated on Dorval Carter. I was seeing like a New York Times piece on it yesterday and I was like, everyone knows about him. Um, so it's just kind of a vote of no confidence. City council doesn't have the power to remove Dorval Carter. That's something that goes up to the mayor and I think the CTA board. So this was kind of always supposed to be a performative thing. But it, it is surprising, like, how many aldermen signed on to that. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of the aldermen that didn't, it's definitely there is a pattern that it's black aldermen on the south and west sides. It's very much a black caucus thing. And I think some of it may be that people perceive it as like a witch hunt, like not my words, uh, that Dorval Carter is being blamed for all these problems and that we don't have like the right accountability metrics for him. Like, how can we take him away from his job? Yeah. Somebody was like, tell that to his wife and his <laughs> kids. And I was like, whoa, bro. Whoa, 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 and whoa, whoa. When do we whoa. ever do that? When someone is like a public figure, like you talk to, you know, take it to his wife and his kids and then tell him like, that's not what we're here for. Yeah, people were really outraged. I feel real gaslit in this conversation, if I'm being honest, by public officials who are making me, me and other people who are having this conversation and, and this criticism feel like it's supposed to be hands off. Like this is taboo. We shouldn't touch this because this person ha has a family or as the mayor would say, we don't talk about hirings and firings in the public, which, again, and all of those cases, these things are true. But this same grace is not extended to a lot of people. And again, probably wouldn't be extended to us in our workplace if people felt like for years we we not only that our organizations, you know, sort of weren't meeting their goals, but that we're like not showing up to take accountability time and time again. And when we do show up very defensive, I feel like, uh, you know, we're we're being made to feel like we're wrong for 
for for wanting some answers. Well, and it felt a little unfair to make it personal, right? To make it mm-hmm. about, you know, his family. Um, obviously, the family was not being attacked in that instance, right? But it's he doesn't do his job, you know, for his family. That job is for the people who take the CTA um, every day and so that they can get, you know, to their jobs and their families. Um, and so just that, that felt like a strange, um, a strange defense, I think. I think part of the like CTA's defense has been, you know, oh, we've hired like a ton of people like in the last year or so um, to sort of improve that problem. But I mean, apparently they've got a massive uh, budget problem that's on track as well. Yeah, I mean, it's weird because it's like I feel like there's things that are in the CTA's control and like things that are outside it, like the Mm -hmm. fiscal cliff where we're just going to run out of some of that money in 2026. That's that part of that just like is not on CTA. Like part of that is just how we choose to fund public transit through like Mm -hmm. relying so heavily on ridership fares. Some of that is like more people are choosing to work from home. So they're just not going to come back to public transit last year, like 2023 ridership was 60% of what it was before the pandemic. It's like some of those people maybe just lost trust with public transit. It feels like we're doing like a little city cash, Chicago, Illinois animal corner uh, because we are uh, in these next two going to be talking about Kopi and we're going to be talking about Cicada. But Rima, I want to start with uh, Kopi and this sort of six hundred thousand dollar rebrand by the Illinois Department of Natural Resource. A couple of I feel like a couple of years ago now, the city cash Chicago team went out. Got some Kopi, learned how to cook it up. Simone like made these Kopi burgers. We ate them. Honestly, it was the first and the last time I had it in my life. And uh, and and I wonder, and I've been wondering, is it picking up? Are people eating it? And so, what's the latest here? Yeah, so I am obsessed with this like eater piece by uh, Zwindy Wang. So like in 2022, Illinois had this massive marketing campaign to rebrand Invasive Carp as um, the Kopi. It's supposed to be in Copious, so it's short for that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and the hope was just to get people to eat it because it's an invasive species and it's gonna it's it's gonna mess up Lake Michigan. I feel like in 2022, it was like people really there were a lot of branding events. There were a lot of like you could go specifically to this like pop up restaurant and they'd have a menu and there would be like Kopi tacos and things like that. But now I can't find them anymore, and I <laughs> I, I don't know where they went. I think like I thought they were everywhere. I don't even know if it tastes good. I haven't tried it. <laughs> It was, it was, you know, it, it wasn't catfish. It wasn't salmon, right? It wasn't, wasn't a good brand Zeno or nothing, but it was, it was, it was, it Fine. was copious. It was a lot of it. <laughs> it, was copious. It, was a whole, it was a whole lot of it. So, so when we're looking at uh, officials who have, you know, they're in a five, they're a five year campaign. So we're 2021, we're two years in. So they're still making this push, but it doesn't seem like right now. It, it's it's working all that well. Uh, are, do, are officials like optimistic that, you know, they got more time to, to get this through? Honestly, this is the first time <laughs> I heard about the Kopi in like a year. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like it's like they're trying to make fetch happen. And like, <laughs> we, <laughs> we just I don't know. Maybe we just don't want Kopi enough to like justify a restaurant offering it like, like uh-huh. compared to like salmon or like tuna. But like, I'll try it. I just don't know where to find it. <laughs> Well, so I'm looking at this Eater article and I think like, it looks like it's kind of hard to process. Like it's really bony. Mm -hmm. It is. And so you can't just serve like a filet of Kopi, um, which just just feels weird to say. And so they're like, oh, all right, well, maybe we can make it into patties or whatever. But I think that's just not very cost effective. And so I think like some folks tried and then they were like, this is too hard. We're just going to move on. Like, so what if the Kopi are copious? Like it's... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> if we can't get it on a plate with, you know, with any manner of efficiency, we're just going to mm-hmm. not bother. Just remember, you say if you find it uh, out here, you you're going you're gonna to give it a try for sure. Oh, yeah. I just want to know what it's like. It would be nice if we did eat them because they're just going to be in an invasive species and we're stuck with this problem. But you hear you hear for the know. ecological benefit of, of consuming them. And so you, you, you hope that we, we pick this up a little bit. I wonder, are they marketing it to the wrong people? Should this, because if it's difficult to serve and humans are just like, eh, this is just okay. Should we like be offering this to the cats? Should this be cat food? Or like, is there a better way to to rid ourselves of 
the copious amounts of copy and <laughs> we don't also have to eat it. <laughs> Just throwing that out there, IDNR. <laughs> Brandis, you are on Cicada Watch 2024 or Cicada Mania, as you've been calling it. Earlier this week, I talked about seeing my first bit of Cicada out in my uh, homie's backyard at Homewood, but they were at the point where they were still on the ground. The juvenile cicadas hadn't sort of shed their exoskeletons, gotten their adult wings, and then like sort of get into the trees. Uh, so they, they weren't at that point yet. But have you seen any cicada yeah, in your neighborhood or around the city. Have I? Okay, so I live in the burbs. And here's the thing, like the folks who live in the city, you're not going to see them as much as those of us who live near the woods or um, or in the burbs. We've done so much underground work in the city proper, digging up, rising the city, bearing all those things. Yes. Well, and, and they need they need forestry. And, and I won't say that I'm on Cicada Watch because everything I know about cicadas, I learned from Patty Wetley. So... <laughs> <laughs> who is our urban nature reporter and she is, she's all over Cicada Watch 2024. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, I have seen quite a few. I live in Skokie, Evanston-ish, and I think it was Sunday morning, I walked out my front door and the exoskeletons and the, you know, the newly shed cicadas were just like crawling all up the beams of my house. And I alert my 11-year-old who effing loves the bugs and so i've got pictures of him like one with one like crawling up his shoulder or holding three or four in his hand he was out like walking around the neighborhood the other day i drive like i'm taking my littler one for a ride in the car and we pick blake up and we drive for like littler. five minutes the littler <laughs> one he's five and they're both massive <laughs> and we get back to the house and the 11 year old announces very calmly i've had cicadas in my pocket this whole time uh like how many a bunch <laughs> he had four <laughs> what an announcement in his little 11 year old pocket <laughs> and he pulls them out and he's got all these cicadas in his hand i get the enthusiasm it's only gonna happen every 220 plus years these two broods coming out at the exact same, at the same time. time yes that said this particular brood was out 17 years ago. Shout out to your son for right. still having that imagination and that enthusiasm for cicadas. We talked to people who are super excited about this. We talked to David Hammond. He making cicada sushi right now. He went out collecting nope. them off his trees. We got a whole episode about cicada recipes. So people not only trying to eat the 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 kopi, they eating the cicadas too. I got a guy for you because Ben Meyer not said I got a guy for you. I got a guy G. for you. Ben Meyerson shared on Instagram that he made, wait for it, cicada ice cream. I kid you not. Not the frozen treats come in full circle. Does anyone know what they taste like? Or like, is it just like a salty thing? I don't know. I think uh, it's been described as crunchy, sort of peanut butter flavor, like a sort of nutty, Ooh. almost pink. Okay. All right. Brandis <laughs> didn't like that. <laughs> Brandis didn't like that. Fine. Okay. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it takes about four or five days for uh, the cicada to start singing, the males to start singing their mating call. So in some places it might be a little quiet right now, but it's only going to pick up uh, in the next week or two as they get, you know, louder and louder and louder. And so, you know, we still do want to see people's pictures, though. 773-780-0246. Text us the pictures of, of your cicada if you're seeing them in your friend's backyard or out in your front yard. Uh, and if your little person putting them in their pockets, you know. <laughs> honestly, I don't even want to picture that. Just get them out of their pockets, baby. To learn more about the stories we've been talking about in this episode, please head to our show notes. There you'll find more on the city council's vote on the potential future of ShotSpotter. You can learn more about the, the carp rebrand to Kopi, learn more about Cicada Mania, and more in our show notes. But before we get out of here, uh, my favorite part of most of our episodes is some good news every single episode we like to end off with an event something uh positive that's happening something we want to put citycast listeners on rima i want to start with you you recently published a piece with block club chicago uh, about a group of west side community gardeners please tell us more 
Yes. It's called the Train the Trainer program. So it's just been a group of West Side gardeners from different neighborhoods just coming together at the Garfield Park Conservatory. And they're just kind of learning different gardening skills, like how to set up garden beds. Um, they've been kind of doing this for the past four months. So they had their like little like graduation thing um, a couple weeks ago. Because a lot of people like had a lot of experience and a lot of people were just starting. So it was like mm-hmm. definitely like a everyone is trading different tips about like gardening. Some of them are like herbalists. Some of them are um, w- definitely a lot of people want to start growing plants for food as a like a food sustainability thing, um, mitigating uh, like food deserts where they are. So I, I love that. They're just kind of showing people like how like different things to make like gardening easier. Like there's a lot of like assistive technology to help if you like have trouble bending or like you can't do a lot of like repetitive hand movements. And I love that. Chicago is a weird place to garden, I think, because like you can't plant directly in the soil because of like lead contamination and stuff. So like you just kind of like have to be crafty and like figure out how to make it work. Thank you so much for writing this story. We're going to drop a link in the show notes. People, please check it out. Uh, Brandis, over to you. We want to continue this love we are giving to the WNBA and the Chicago Sky. Their home opener is this Saturday. Uh, at Wintrust Arena, they're gonna be taking on the Connecticut Sun. I'm excited for this. Uh, but you wanted to to give a little bit of get a, give a little bit of shine to the league overall uh, in the way that the women is bossing up right now. Yeah, just because, right? Like I realize that everybody's been talking about these women, um, you know, since March Madness, which they are finally able to use. But I don't think you can give too much love to women uh, who are bossing up the way that they are. So I'm just gonna keep the party going. Um, because the other thing is, there's a couple of things that I noticed this week. One. Um, the league saw a 14% increase in attendance, um, I think for, uh, over last year for the New York and Indiana, um, leading the way with like having the most folks attending their games. I think ESPN is noticing that the viewership for the broadcasts is through the roof, um, for, uh, for the WNBA, like with some triple digit increases, um, for some of them, but then also Angel Reese, who, as we all know, plays for the Chicago Sky. She is also mm-hmm. now part owner um, of a women's professional uh, football club, a professional soccer club um, that is in D.C. And she's got roots in D.C. because um, she is from the area. And then she actually started off her basketball career with the University of Maryland before she went to LSU. I think part of the reason that she said she did it is just, you know, to, to continue the support for women's sports. So I just wanted to give them like a shout out for like, you know, for keeping it going. They're not like you know, just kind of like sitting back on their laurels and it's like, well, I'm just going to play a little bit of basketball over here now that I've, you know, now that I'm here. But like people are also people are tuning in and watching, which I think is is amazing. And, you know, I think the women are showing what they can do, given the opportunity. Facts. It's it's really good to see, again, not only the love uh, being shown sort of league wide, but also I've just been listening to Camilla and to Angel uh, and, and some of the other players for the sky just talk about the love that they feel in the city, like as they are getting to know Chicago, falling in love with it themselves. Um, I appreciate how they are uh, sort of representing the city in such a bright light. And, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. Again, home opener this Saturday. Uh, we're going to continue to show love this entire season. Uh, and then I'm going to close this out with my good news. Uh, it really feels like this weekend, even though we've already seen some festivals, some literary festivals, uh, some small neighborhood festivals um, over the last few weeks, uh, it feels like this week really sort of kicks us off for uh, Chicago summertime festival season because you got Mole de Mayo this weekend over in Pilsen, which again is gonna have amazing food. I'm extremely excited for two days of lucha libre wrestling in the middle of the street. Uh, but then we also got Sueños, uh, which is like one of the big music festivals in the city of Chicago. And so it really feels like this weekend uh, things are are sort of getting into action. Uh, Rima, do you have a Chicago summer festival that you are really looking forward to? I really like going to, I forgot the name of it, but like there's usually like a literary festival around Printer's Row. I love Printer's Row Lit Fest. I love going to that. It's so fun. It's like there's little like Um, Mm pop-ups. I like getting little goodies. The problem is I always take the train back. So I'm like, I got it. Whenever I go to a bookstore, it's like kind of a danger because I'm like, if I get like six books, it's like, this is actually a bad time. Brandis, what about you? What's a, a festival you're looking forward to? I never make it to as many fests as I would like. I'm, honestly, I make it to very few, partly because I live in the burbs and then those af- the aforementioned children uh, 
because <laughs> you got to take them with you. And, uh, um, <laughs> and so the one that I've always wanted to go to, or one of the ones, a couple of them, I, I want to go to like a house music fest or the chosen few DJs. Um, mm-hmm. That one, like I've always wanted to go to that one. And so I'm trying to convince a friend that we need to go this year. That's what's up. I believe chosen few is at Jackson Park, July 13th. Uh, and Printers Row Lit Fest is, I believe that first weekend of September. Uh, again, Mole de Mayo, Sueños kicking off. The best way to keep up with all of the events, all of the festivals, the things that are happening in our city, head over to our events calendar uh, at chicago.citycast.fm. And we're willing to send you all of these things in your inbox every morning, Monday through Friday. All you got to do is sign up for our free newsletter, Hey Chicago, uh, while you're there at the website. Uh, we got something very special planned for our festival coverage this summer. Uh, so make sure if you are new to CityCast Chicago, you come back. Uh, and if you've been riding with us for the last three years in the 800 plus episodes, you know, this would be a, this wouldn't be a good time to fall off the ship. Just kind of stick around, uh, you know, keep showing up. We're going to be here. I want to give another huge thank you to the host of Chicago Tonight and Black Voices for WTTW, Brandis Friedman and freelance writer Rima Sala. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. One more thing before we get out of here. I got to give a huge thank you to our executive producer, Simone Alisea, our producer, Michelle Navarro, our Hey Chicago newsletter editor, Sydney Madden, our roving producer this week, Dylan Brogan. The music we all love is from Sam Thousand, all the kimonos, and Mark Greenberg from the Mayfair Workshop. And my last thank you is for you. The people who listen to City Cash Chicago, who put up with my singing every single day. Uh, the people who are taking our listener survey. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Give me a quick second to tell you about it. Uh, you know, it's our annual listener survey. We're trying to figure out who's listening to City Cash Chicago. How can we better serve you on the podcast and in the Hey Chicago newsletter? It's going to take you like, you know, three, five, seven minutes, depending on, you know, how long it take you to get through it. But, you know, if you if you kind of move through it pretty quickly, you should be OK. And you could enter for a chance to win a two hundred and fifty dollar Visa gift card. Again, just do us the quick favor. Even if you took the survey last year, do it again for the homies. We appreciate you. We're going to be here bright and early on Tuesday. We're taking Monday off of Memorial Day, but we'll talk to you next week. Peace.